Um, I am I am really really hungry right about now. Um, but um, those of you that know, you watch uh, Facebook or just talk with us any part in time. Um, we are working through a process, Kim and I, of trying to lose some weight. So we're on a diet, and it's kind of got restrictions. I hate diets, restrictions. Camry's holding a brownie in her hand. It's just, you know, it's just not right. It's just not right. Um, it's, it's, it's tough, and right now I'm actually really, really hungry because, you know, I ate before I came here to the church this morning, and then I've been going ever since, and I'm supposed to be snacking every once in a while. And I didn't bring a snack. I didn't know nothing. And so, um, so Gary cut one of the songs out so we can get to eating faster. And um, but um, but I get hungry. And 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 um, and you think of all the things that you're hungry for. I mean, I've gone without food before. I've I've done I've done fasting. I've done other things where um, where I'm like, okay, I'm doing this for a spiritual purpose and not really a, a diet purpose or getting myself any better. And and you start looking at food and it's like, man, that really sounds good. I really that really looks good. That really smells good. And, 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 and you start craving certain things. You start wanting certain things really, really badly. Um, this time, we're, we're trying to change habits in our lives. As you can see, I'm a large gentleman, so I need to, to change habits in my life in order, to, uh, in order to help myself be healthier. And so we're trying to change tastes and change habits. And we're learning to do different things. And, and so we're, we're cutting out stuff, you know, cutting out sugar. And I love sugar. Sugar is good for you. If God didn't want you to eat it, why did he make it so tasty? Um, why didn't he make, you know, broccoli more tasty? But, um, but you know, we're cutting out sugar, cutting out, you know, high fatty things. And, and my favorite is I love milk. Um, and, and we had to cut milk out of the diet and, and I'm a, I'm a milk guy. I mean, if you've ever been around my house, you know, we can't keep milk in the house because of how quickly I consume it. I just love it. It's just my favorite. And, um, and so I would, I know, you know, and so chug, chug, chug. Don't tell people, shh, don't tell people. Um, but, but I love milk. And so I drink it. So on this diet, and you're looking through, and the diet has some options. And one of the options is you could buy rice milk, which, rice milk, and uh, my daughter has to drink it all the time. And it's one of those things, because I love milk so much, you know, you, you get done with, you know, I'm, I'm doing the drinking out of the jug thing, just in case you don't know. So when you finish uh, drinking all the milk that you have, and you're like, I want some more milk, and you see Cambry's rice milk laying around, like, there's milk in the title, and I've tried it, like, yeah. But she likes it. She's like, it's good. It was like... No, it's not good. It's not milk. It's not yummy, yummy milk from a cow. And um, and so so I've tried rice milk before. In our diet, like I'm allowed to have rice milk and I'm allowed to have coconut milk. And I remember fondly when I was a kid, I lived on a tropical island. We would get coconuts out of trees. We would poke holes in them. We would drink the milk out of it. And as a kid, I was like, this is pretty darn fine. It's not quite the same when you're buying it out of a grocery store. Um, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go buy me some some coconut milk because I can have it. Milk, milk, coconut milk. And I drank it the first day and it was wretched. It was the worst stuff I'd had in a long, long time. It tasted kind of like water that somebody had put, you know, white food coloring in it and then squeezed some lime. And also it was really, really, the whole thing was just a bad, bad experience on day two diet drinking coconut milk. By, by day seven, that coconut milk started tasting really, really good because I hadn't been able to eat anything else and I hadn't been able to drink anything else. It was water, 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 and lemon juice, lemon juice, lemon juice, and, and the same thing over and over and over. And I'm finally like, I'm going to give that coconut milk another shot. And all of a sudden, because I've been deprived of so many things so long, my body's like, eh, it ain't that bad. It's really not that bad. Your tastes start changing. When you start getting hungry and thirsty, you ever watch those survivor shows where people are eating bugs and you're thinking, I could never eat bugs. Well, yeah, yeah, because you got a refrigerator full of food. I mean, why in the world would you eat bugs? You got a refrigerator full of food. But, you know, if you crash in the Amazon somewhere and you got nothing else, you haven't eaten in five days, eventually you start looking at that bug thinking, well, ain't that bad of an option right now. Well, we kind of pick and choose. It changes our taste depending on our circumstances. Where we are, it changes our taste. My, my wife was eating avocados the other day. She doesn't eat avocados, doesn't like them. But because she wants to try stuff different and it's on our thing, she's like, I'm going to eat me an avocado. I was like, holy cow, she's got avocados on a salad. And, um, and, and we were eating guacamole, which was just avocado and tomatoes with no good stuff in it. But, but it was great. She's eating avocados. We changed tastes. 
We change what we eat. We change what we like. When when we get a hunger, when we get a when we get a drive for something, and and this this series we're talking about, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the fire. What we've been talking about is um, we're we're talking about the the life of Christ, the story of Christ, his story about how. Um, it wasn't just Jesus showed up and then everybody's like, I love you, you're Jesus, and followed him around and he was a rock star and, and was in limos and stretch camels and things like that and it was all wonderful. It wasn't like that. It, everywhere he went, there was somebody that was out to get him. There was somebody after them. There was somebody that was, that was challenging him, somebody that was coming after him. And, and, and the people that followed Jesus had to pay a price in order to follow Jesus. There was heat that came with it. There was there was a there was there was something that had to that, that, that affected them because they were following Christ. There there was there was there was daily drama, daily problems. Jesus promised them at times, you know, you, you're you're not coming after me, and things are going to be roses. In fact, you follow me, and it's going to be like it's going to be like the sword's going to be following you everywhere you go. There's constantly going to be fighting and quarreling and, and problems and troubles. And not that Jesus was causing them, but the people that hated Jesus were just trying to get him down and put him down. And one of the things that Jesus tried to teach his disciples was that same thing about when you truly, truly thirst for God. When you truly, truly hunger for God, your tastes are going to begin to change. Even in the midst of hard times and difficult times and destruction and pain and people coming after you, at some point in time as a Christian, at some point in time as a follower of Christ, our tastes have to change. And so today we're going to see kind of Jesus laying that challenge down to his disciples and trying to help them out. I mean, he always taught, but in John chapter 6, here, here he's teaching to a... Um, Probably a more intimate crowd than normal. This is not like to everybody in the world. But um, but he's gone back home. This is back kind of where he was raised. And he is doing some teaching. And, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The person who aligns with me hungers no more and thirsts no more ever. I have told you this explicitly because even though you have seen me in action, you don't really believe me. Every person the Father gives me eventually comes running to me. And once that person is with me, I hold on and don't let go. You know, we talk about that taste. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. He, he's, he's challenging them and calling them, you need to hunger for something. And what you need to hunger for is you need to hunger for me. When I fast, bread is one of those things that my body craves when, when I go without food for long periods of time just just having a you know seeing a commercial with a biscuit on I'm like it's a biscuit oh, I'd love to have a biscuit and um, you know having having a piece of bread the smell of of fresh bread it, it, it's an intoxicating smell it, it, it's great and, and bread has a lot of grain and things that can sustain you and and uh, back in their days I mean it was it was a major staple that Jesus is talking about and here Jesus says I am the bread of life I don't know what they crave and what they want, but I know what I crave and what I want. I mean, I, I crave, I crave and want, you know, I crave and want, you know, a bun on my hamburger. I don't want to have to have a leaf burger, leaf and lettuce and lettuce and a burger in the middle. And, and uh, I, I crave, um, I crave having certain sauces and I crave certain foods. I crave, I crave, I crave. Even though I crave those things, Jesus is saying it's time to crave something else. It's time to crave the bread of life. It's time to crave something that will sustain. And if you were at camp, you know, we talked a lot about how Jesus called himself the living water. But here Jesus is calling himself the bread of life. He's calling himself food that sustains. But it didn't really mesh with the people that were around. Can a man sustain you is basically what the people that see Jesus are wondering. Can Christ sustain? Can Christ help you survive? Can you make it in life on just Christ? And back then, they had rituals and they had ceremonies and had so many other things. Today, we got so many other things that help us sustain life. I mean, um, I'm losing weight because, you know, I need to lose weight. But there's some people that worship the gym. I mean, they're there every single day, every single night. They worship the gym. That, that's something that, that sustains them. And there's some that worship fashion. And they're, they're always saying, hey, fashion is my deal. I want to know about fashion. I want to push fashion. I, I just want to, to live 
fashion, and there's others that, that do it through their education, there's others that do it through, through, through books, or through games, or through so many other things in life that we say, this is what makes me whole, this is what sustains me, this is what identifies me as a person, and Jesus says, you need to find a way to make me what sustains you. But that was tough for people. Look what people said in John chapter 6, just after this. In John chapter 6, verse 41 and 42, at this, because he said, uh, the passage, the people became, became agitated, upset about this, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. The Jews started arguing over him. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Don't we know his father? Don't we know his mother? How can he now say, I came down out of heaven and expect anyone to believe him? You know, last week when we talked about the heat that Jesus experienced, Jesus experienced that really difficult heat of, of people around you, people near you, uh, maybe those at your school, maybe those at your workplace, people that you see socially, people at the grocery store, of those people um, not liking you because of your faith. Uh, harassing you because of your faith, because of your belief in Christ. Today it's a little more insidious because Jesus is no longer out on a crowd on a hillside. He's no longer um, talking to just all these people, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and, and, and the scribes and all those people that, that would attack him. Here he's at home talking to a group of his friends. Here he's at home talking to people that he knows intimately and cares about and and Jesus is trying to tell them, look, you know, I know you, I care about you, and I want you to know I am the bread of life. I will sustain you. And his neighbors, his neighbors, the people that lived near him his whole life, the people that grew up around him, the people that experienced him the most, they start saying, I'm the bread that came out of heaven? Seriously? We know his dad is Joseph. He's the carpenter down the road. We know his mom. It's Mary. We, we know all of his brothers and sisters. We, we know all of them. And, and this guy's coming in here saying, you need to develop a taste for me. You need to develop a taste for the bread of life. And I'm the bread of life that has come down out of heaven. Like manna from the sky, that's who I am. God has sent me to provide for you. Weren't you that kid? that went to school with my kid? Weren't you that kid that helped work in the carpentry shop with your dad and, and, and built a table for, for my house? And weren't you the kid that did all those things that we knew? And we know your dad and we know your mom. We know everything about you. And I want you to know sometimes the hardest, hardest place it is to live your faith is living your faith at home. Sometimes the hardest place to... to to, to be genuinely in love with God is when you're around the people that know you the most. Because the problem is the people that know you the most, they remember everything. They know what you did last year. And they know what you did five years ago. The people you live with know all your faults and all your problems. They, they, they know the things that are going to trip you up and mess you up. They know that look you get when, when you're mad or angry or disappointed. You may fool everybody else in the world, but you're at home. Mama knows when things are going on. Your brothers and sisters know what's going on in your head. And, 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 and they've had fights with you and quarrels with you. And, and when you come in and say, I'm a child of God. I've been changed. I'm new. I'm, I'm brand new. Jesus is the bread of life. And, then I'm, and I'm following him. And they're like, yeah. That'll last. I remember that time we got you a fish and then you stopped feeding it after three weeks. Yeah, that's how this Jesus thing's going to be. You love him for a little bit. You're excited about it now because camp was cool, camp was fun, or, or you had a great experience at church and so all those things are nice. Yeah, that's fun. But come on. The rest of your life forever, you're going to live this way? Show me when school starts back up. Show me two, three weeks after school. All right, school's been going, and now you're back with your friends, and now things are starting to starting to go a little off. Let's ditch a class. Let's harass a, a kid that's new. Let's cause some problems. Let's write on a desk. Let's tear up a book. I don't know what it is, but but let's begin to let's begin to just swerve a little bit. Go off a little bit. 
And it's so easy to do that. And the people around us know us so, so well. How hard is it when God's finally changed our lives for us to go back to those people and say, look, I know, I know I've messed up. But this is who I am now. This is what I am now. And Jesus never even really messed up. They just look at Joseph and Mary and their families and they're just like, wow, well, you know, he's just one of us. If you ever grew up in one of those little towns, little town people always think, well, you know, I'm just a little town person. You can't ever do anything better. We used to live in a little town called Honey Grove. And that was kind of the idea. We, we had these kids. We took all over the United States doing, uh, doing amazing things. And God was doing great things. And we get back. We're like, what do you kids want to do? It's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just stay here. We had some families and moms and dads that already you know, said, well, you're, they're just going to buy the house right next door to me. Oh, I'm not going to do anything. We get that that small town mentality that they had with Jesus and they said, how can we, how can we trust this guy? He's, he's a guy from Nazareth. Come on. Nazareth? That guy's going to change the world? Psh, I don't think so. I don't think so. And we see small town guys and small town people and they just begin to dismiss Jesus. And sometimes the hardest place is with the people we know the best. And so Jesus ministers, but it's rough and it's tough. Because the people he's closest to and loves the most don't listen. Well, he goes on in John chapter 6, a little bit further down. says, Jesus didn't give an inch to them. They're making fun of him. They're saying, hey, you're the son of the carpenter, Joseph's son. But Jesus didn't give an inch. He said, insofar as, only insofar as you eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man... Do you have life within you? The one who brings a hearty appetite to this eating and drinking has eternal life and will be fit and ready for the final day. And many among his disciples heard this and said, this is tough teaching, too tough to swallow. So Jesus goes one step further. Now, Jesus is speaking to friends, families, disciples, and not his key disciples, not the twelve but some of the other people that have been following him and learning and growing, they start hearing Jesus teach and they're like, that's tough, Jesus. That's hard stuff. I mean, it's like me in a diet. I look at a diet, I'm like, I need to diet. In my mind, I can always imagine myself like bench pressing 200 pounds and, and um, you know, I remember back when I was a kid, Herschel Walker was, you know, a big football player, you know, when I was growing up. I loved Herschel Walker. And they told stories about how he did a thousand sit-ups every night. I'm Herschel Walker. I do a thousand sit-ups every night. Um, probably holding, you know, two kids in each hand or something. He was, you know, that was Herschel Walker. And, and I don't need to wear all those pads because I just got these things, all right? And so, Kevin knows. You loved Herschel Walker, too. Don't tell me you didn't. Don't tell me you didn't. You did. All right. I know. You you played you played Herschel Walker on Tecmo Bowl. I know you did. All right. So, um so, you know, that, that's, you know, I'm going to do a thousand sit-ups every night just like Herschel Walker, and that's who I'm going to be. That's what, in my mind, that's happening, all right? My body has not quite happened yet. I haven't gotten there. I can get up to three, and I'm doing good. So 997 more to go, and I'm on it. I got it all taken care of. And so, uh, so I, I, I have in my mind, this is a great plan. It's what I want to do. There were people that were following Jesus and said, this is a great plan. I'm going to follow this Jesus guy. He's teaching about love. He, he cares about people. Every once in a while, he does something freaky cool, which is nice. You know, he just got finished feeding 5,000 people with a couple of fish. And that's outstanding. And, and, and this guy's just, he's just great to hang around. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, oh, yeah, by the way, you got to eat my flesh and eat my blood. Like, is he a vampire? Zombie? What's going on with him? And yeah, you got to have this great commitment. And he starts throwing down all this stuff that you got to do to be to be a follower of his. And then people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Back it up, Jesus. We're just here for the cool show. We want you to show us some other nice stuff. You know, bring some people back from the dead. But, you know, have a little flair with it this time. You know, one of these things, bring them back. And that's what we want to see, Jesus. I don't want to hear all this stuff about me having to do work, me, me getting involved, me, me having to, to change my appetite and live for you. And I realized that 
spiritually, our appetites have to change. Our appetites have to be more than what they were before we met Christ. They have to crave Him. They have to want to have Jesus in our lives. That, to have Him guiding us and directing us. We have to want to have the bread of life. We have to want to feast on what Jesus brings. He tells them that you need to bring an appetite. You need to come hungry for Christ. Change what you're thirsty for. Do you still get to do those other stuff? Yeah, you still get to do other stuff. But is your craving, is your desire coming to Christ? And if your desire is not coming to Christ, then, then you don't have what it takes to be a disciple. And the people that were following him, many of them said, that is, that's rough and too tough to swallow. And so, last week we talked about Jesus getting opposition from the outside. Today, Jesus begins getting opposition, not just from his neighbors, but he starts getting it from his friends. His friends start to falter in their belief and their faith and their trust and their hope. His friends, the ones that are closest to him, begin saying, this is too much. I can't handle it. And in our faith, Jesus every day calls us to live our faith. And you know what? Sometimes we live our faith, it's going to cause some of our friends to falter. We're going to have friends that say, hey, you know, dude, you're not like you used to be. You're not cool like you were. You used to do all this awesome stuff, and, and we used to get in trouble. We used to go do all these kind of different things, and, and that was life. And, and you start saying, no, this is what God's called me to be, and friends will falter. They'll say, I don't want any part of that. I don't want to be near that. I don't want to be, I don't want to be associated with that, and our friends will falter. And Jesus' friends began to falter. And in fact, it goes even a little bit farther. In John chapter 6, verses 66 and following, the very end of the chapter, the same thing. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. He says, come and hunger for me. And his, his neighbor said, yeah, but you're just, you're just the son of a carpenter. And Jesus says, you know, it's not just hungering for me as the bread of life, but you've got to eat my flesh and eat my body, which, which he was trying to say, you've got to, you've got to invest everything you have in me. And so his disciples were saying, that's tough. And it goes one step further. After this, a lot of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with them. Then Jesus gave the 12 their chance. Do you also want to leave? And Peter replied, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. We've already committed ourselves, confident that you are the Holy One of God. You know, the word abandon can be both a verb and a noun. What I find interesting is Abandon as a verb means something different than abandon as a noun does. When you say, uh, I'm going to abandon this person. I'm going to abandon this person. It means you're leaving them. You're getting away from it. There were disciples that, that when they got to that point that Jesus said, you must invest everything in me. You've got to turn everything to me. That heat got too high. It was too rough. It was too much. And they abandoned him. They left him. They never came back. It doesn't say just to some, but a lot of his disciples said they no longer wanted to be associated with them. When you get too close to Christ, there's going to be people that don't want to associate with you. I'm sorry, it's just going to happen. There's going to be people that are too uncomfortable being around you because of your faith, because of, of your commitment to God. They don't want to be associated with you. They're going to abandon the faith. They're going to abandon God. They're going to abandon it. But abandon as a noun means something completely different. If I say, I want you to follow Christ with abandon, be abandoned for Christ, that actually means I follow him with not just a little bit, not just some, it means I follow him with everything that's in me, with exuberance and excitement. And that's what Peter says. Peter says, where in the world are we going to go, God? Where are we going to go, Jesus? We have already committed our all to you. We know that you're the Holy One of God. And you have the words of real life, eternal life, everlasting life. He said, we'll follow you with exuberance. We'll follow you with excitement. We will follow you with abandon. And even though they have left, we will come after you. You know, those 12, and Jesus goes on to say he, he knew that even among those 12, Satan was still working. Judas eventually betrays him. But 
But with abandon, they choose to follow God. They choose to follow Christ. The heat came up on Christ from even within his own group. From within his own followers in his own town, his own people. They said, we want to turn away from you and go another way. But Peter still stands tall and he says, God with abandon, Jesus with abandon, I will follow you. My call for you today is, Lord, is, is that you would change your appetite. That you would hunger for what Christ has to offer. That it would, that it would be reflected in your life and everything that you do. Is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be dieting if it wasn't hard. What I did was easy, eating lots of hamburgers with bacon on it and lots of cheeses. That's easy. Tastes good. Goes down good. It's yummy. It's hard. Hard getting into good habits. The world likes to tell you easy things to do. The world likes to show you easy ways to live your life. Easy ways to follow, to follow the crowd. When we start hungering for God, it's hard. But it's worth it. Because in the long run, we whip ourselves into shape. If we were angry, we find a way to have peace. If we were, if we were constantly doubting, we find ways to have hope. If, if, we're, if we're always sad and depressed, we find ways to get joy. Just like I whip a flabby body back into shape, I can whip a flabby soul, a flabby life by just craving the things of God. Would you all pray with me?